What I'm going to talk about is small data and why small data is beautiful, in my view. Um, not necessarily more beautiful than big data, but a beautiful part of data. So, um, and what I'm going to be doing as I do that is to reference my own experience of, of analysing political data, um, talking about a couple of elections that I've worked on, including the most recent one. So, but first of all, why is small data so beautiful? Why is it so important? I think it does a number of things, some of which big data can't do or doesn't do very well. The first is it provides a kind of diagnosis. So how I always explain it, if I'm talking to a client or a potential client that hasn't used qualitative research before, I say, what the quantitative data, what the big numbers will tell you is 70% of people think this or that or the other. And what the qualitative data will do is to help you to understand why they think that. And in my view, that really matters and you need to know it. What it can also do is give very deep insight, particularly into specific audiences. So, for instance, in an election scenario, we might be very interested in how particular groups of voters are behaving and performing and what they're thinking. And I think that it has a unique ability to help us to do that. It can also give behavioural insight. And in fact, one of the projects I'm going to talk about is one where we used a kind of ethnographic element. And so what we're doing is we're understanding how people behave, what they did, rather than what they tell us they did. Because I think one of the problems with any kind of collected data is you're relying on people's memories. They're not always perfect. They might not remember very well, or they might not want to share with you exactly what they did. They might want to finesse it slightly. So actually, the kind of behavioral insight that you get can tell you exactly what people did. It can be citizen-led. One of the problems with polling is that you ask the person a question and they answer the question, but by the very nature that you of, of asking them the question, you have kind of prompted them. Um, with the project that I'm going to talk about, all of the activity was voter-led. They could talk about whatever they wanted, however they wanted to. And I think it gave us some very different findings. It's very vivid as well. If I'm trying to collect data and make it data that I need to act on, or actually, as is more often the case in my case, trying to persuade somebody else to act on. It really helps to be able to use the voice of, in this case, the voter, uh, to help people to really understand what that person thinks and feels. It's much more persuasive than me telling them about it or a number describing it. What else? There are lots and lots of different sorts of qualitative. I'm happy to talk about any of these. I use a, a mix of all of them. I use uh, qualitative, I use group discussions, I use focus groups. We use a lot of co-creation where you might have different audiences kind of coming up with solutions collectively. Uh, delib deliberative where you might give people some information to kind of upskill them. Um, and ethnographic, which I've talked about. And then the other thing about small data is is it really so much less accurate than big data? And this, I think, is one of the really interesting questions. Um, because the last election, of course, was not the first time, as most of you in the room, I'm sure, will know, that the polls got it wrong. Um, and I got the short straw in 1992. I happened to be running the Labour Party's polling programme uh, in that election. And you can see here... Uh, what the polls told us as we ran through, you know, the, in, in, in the, the polls running up to the election and then, then at the bottom, that, the actual result and how far out it was. Now, one of the interesting things, and actually the, even the, um, the exit poll was wrong, um, and I think that there were, there were a number of reasons, it, you know, there was a big inquiry and in fact the polls have seem to be relatively accurate since then, up until 2015. But one of the things that actually, that I learned in that election was to trust my instincts better. Because throughout that election, I was managing, I was obviously doing reviews of all the polling, published polling data. I was re reviewing Labour's own polling data and running that program. But I was also managing a program of focus groups. Here's the interesting thing. People coming back from doing the focus groups were saying, this doesn't feel right. You know, I'm looking in the whites of people's eyes and I don't think they're going to vote Labour. 
set that against the published polling and the uh, and actually Labour's private polling as well. You know, hands up to this. I'm not going to pretend that you know I had it right and others didn't. But setting that insight against those polls, I didn't really trust the instinct. I felt, well, you know, those are numbers, and this is hunchology, isn't it? I mean, actually, it's probably wrong. It turned out not to be. Exactly the same happened in 2015, and in future, I shall be trusting focus groups very much more than I have done. So, um, yeah, in 2015, it all seemed so certain, didn't it? Um, you know, I mean, the, I, don't think, I don't think there was a pundit in the land who didn't predict a hung parliament one way or another. The only question, the only debate was who was going to be the largest party. Uh, and some jumped one way and some jumped the other. But it was literally neck and neck. And um, I don't have to tell all of you because you will know this is where, where we ended up. Um, I mean, interestingly, actually, the smaller parties were more accurately predicted or appeared to be more accurately predicted, but um, way out in terms of the larger parties. So, what was I doing that election? Thankfully, I wasn't running uh, Labour's polling or any other political party's polling, but I was doing quite an interesting project for The Guardian. And what we'd set out to do, actually, was to dig a bit deeper. And we sat down with The Guardian and we uh, debated at some length how we could come up with five seats that would tell the story, because they're a newspaper, they wanted to have a story to tell. We wanted to tell the story of the election. So we picked five seats that we thought would sum up the election quite well. And these are the ones that we, we chose. So we chose Glasgow East because we wanted to see what was happening with the SNP. Was it really taking off? This was actually Margaret Curran's seat, the Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland. We chose Dewsbury, which was a more traditional um, kind of Labour Tory two-way up in the north of England. Uh, Taunton Dean, which was a kind of how far the, is the Lib Dem vote going to collapse kind of seat um, out there in the southwest. Thanet South, for obvious reasons, because Mr Farage was, uh, had decided to make that his gambit for uh, being an MP. And Ealing Central, we were interested to have a London seat because London did seem to be performing very differently um, and we were very interested to see if that, if that was the case. So those were the five seats that we chose. And what we did was unashamedly qualitative. We convened a panel of, in fact, it was more like 15 people um, because we slightly over-recruited in fearing some dropout through the process. In fact, we didn't really get much dropout, so we ended up with a slightly larger sample. 15 people in each of those constituencies. They were chosen in terms of demographics to represent a bit of a split, a bit of a mix of, of, you know, of each constituency. And in, in terms of past voting behavior, they replicated whatever had happened at 2010 in that constituency. And they were all people who said they were undecided how they were going to vote now, but certain to vote. So, what we did was we stayed with them, or they stayed with us, throughout the campaign. We did two things. We, we met with them um, on a number of occasions and ran face-to-face -face focus groups in the constituency. Um, and then the rest of the time, we did something quite interesting. We gave them an app that they could download onto their mobile phone. And this app enabled them to send us, we asked them then to send us their diary of the election telling us whenever something struck them that was interesting and they could tell us whatever they wanted. And as you'll see, they did. Um, but it was completely voter-led. We weren't asking them the question. They were just telling us whatever interested them or, indeed, as was often the case, whatever didn't interest them. Um, and uh, we also set them a number of tasks. We asked, asked some of them to watch the debates and, and did sort of real-time analysis of their responses. We asked them to go out and interview friends whose voting intention was the same as theirs to understand where they were feeling. So we had some sort of like little projective techniques and tasks built in, and it was very, very interesting. So this is what we found. Um, we learned a lot about how they were experiencing the campaign. Um, now, the first thing that we did was we asked them, we met them face to face so that we could brief them on what to do. And we asked them to bring along a photograph, an image uh, that would sum up how they felt about the campaign. And just pulling out some of the things that they, they chose to share with us here. We've got some stuff about the reputation of politicians. So, liars, overpaid, 
Um, we've got uh, that, that bowl. Can you see the bowl in the middle there? This was somebody who said he'd searched in his kitchen for the shallowest bowl that he could find to depict <laughs> the shallowness of modern politics. Um, a lot of people screaming, with, screaming their heads off and so on and shaking their heads and very confused and very worried. And actually, it didn't change that much as the campaign went on. I think one of the things that we learned um, was that almost the more people saw of the campaign, the less sure they felt about how to feel about the campaign. So that was quite interesting. Um, but what did we learn? So we understood their key <laughs> moments. So you can see here the two lines. Uh, the top line is the sheer number of comments. Um, the bottom line is the number of commentators. And you can see there were sort of blips as we went through the campaign. Um, some of them were provoked by, um, by the debates, which was the main thing, the most sort of campaign event that people noticed and were interested in. Um, but a few other things stood out. So, for instance, the first big blip, you can see like two, two blips in or something, was um, the, the trident um, Michael Fallon attack on Ed Miliband, which caused quite a lot of interest. Um, a little bit later on, we got quite a lot of interest about the um, Millie Brand interview, the Russell Brand interview that Ed Miliband did. Um, but you can see there, those, those are some of the things that they are picking up on. Um, but sometimes it wasn't always what you would think. So, for instance, just pulling out one week, and here's one week's analysis. So these were things that happened in one week. It was the beginning of the, the short campaign. So Parliament was dissolved. Uh, there was a bit of a squabble going on about tax. The Lib Dems had pledged a bit more on uh, for mental health. There were business leaders had been signing petitions. A uh, poll had put Farage ahead. Um, and we'd had the first debate. What did they notice? So they sure as hell noticed the debate. And there were lots of comments about the debate. Um, They'd actually picked up on some coverage um, about the future of the NHS, although not much mention about what the Lib Dems had been talking about. Actually, the thing that they mostly mentioned, and the thing that got twice as many mentions as anything else, was this couple from Scunthorpe who won the lottery twice. And they had to kind of work a bit to fit this into their analysis of the campaign, um, but it was all about their personal finances. So, quite interesting. That was what they came up with. What else? Um, you know, Ed Miliband had said, this campaign is going to be about having four million conversations. We're going to be out there. We're going to cut out the middleman of the hostile press. We're going to talk directly to the voters. Local really matters. Well, did it? Actually, no, it didn't, really. Um, so, we analysed all of our diary analysis, and it was quite interesting. So, we had getting on for kind of 600 responses throughout the campaign. And of that 600 responses, just 10% referred to things that were happening in the local constituency, and the other 90% was all about national stuff. Um, and in fact, you could, one person, because people could upload and send us things that they'd spotted, things that interest them. This was one lady who had sent us all of the leaflets that they had been sent. That's just one week's worth of leaflets, right? They are in a marginal. And as she said, you know, I think, wow, so much information, I'm confused.com. It kind of wasn't helping, and most of it actually was going in the bin as soon as it had been photographed and uploaded and sent to us. So, what else did we discover? Um, this is really interesting. Um, apologies, there's a typo. It's voters please, pretty please. No, it's voters please. They say we want, they say we do want to hear more about policy, but do they really? Um, well, not really, I think. What we found was that just 20%, 22% of our diary entries were related in some way to policy, and the rest were all about the election in a non-policy sense, i.e. people, i.e. actually the leaders. And here are a couple of typical quotes. So sometimes the leader, David Cameron, he's strong and confident. Sometimes the leader's wives. I saw Ed Miliband with his, with his wife and kids and thought, oh, he's maybe not as bad as I thought he was. Um, so the vast majority of all of the comments, despite the fact that people told us they wanted policy analysis, they wanted policy detail, why don't people give us policy? They didn't want policy. They weren't noticing policy. They were noticing um, you know, that what, the, what the leaders were up to. Uh, what else? When they did focus on policy, though, they did tend to focus on the economy. So, um, yeah, only a fifth uh, referred to policy areas, but when, when they did, although, in fact, a lot of the polling was saying that the NHS was the thing that people were going to make their minds up about in the election, in fact, the vast majority of comments were about, um, about the economy. 
So, and what we also did, and we did this more in the focus groups, um, was to look at views of the parties and the leaders. And I think that also helps to sort of explain the results a little bit. So I'll run through these quickly. Um, one of the things that we did was we did a personification exercise. If that political party uh, was a person, we're not talking about their leader here, but if, if the party, if the brand was a person, what are they like? Describe them, where do they live, where do they go on holiday, how do they spend their leisure time, what kind of job do they do? And we said, what would their come dine with me menu be? So, here's the Tories come dine with me menu. It's, I suppose it's a bit predictable, really. Uh, we've got caviar, we've got a three-bird roast, it's eat and mess, that sort of pink and white sludge there on the left. And of course, it's all washed down by a bottle of bully. Um, so, we also looked at the leaders and we said, we just showed a photograph, write down the first three words that come into your head. And then we did this repeatedly through the campaign. This is how David Cameron started. It's not bad, actually, because in fact, the biggest thing he's got pretty much is family man. He's a bit posh, he's a bit arrogant, arrogant. he's a little bit clever, a little bit smug, but, but not bad. And then as the campaign progressed, he gets more confident. He also gets more repetitive, which is interesting. He gets smooth, he gets a little bit statesmanlike. Uh, and then that favourite of focus groups, if this person was an animal, what kind of animal would they be? He's a mighty lion. There's no way this guy isn't going to be prime minister. He's a mighty lion, look at him. He's confident, he knows what he's doing. He prowls around. Um, so, the Conservative Party, I think, got the second largest number of mentions, but you can see more negative than positive. Um, quite a lot of confusion, particularly in the policy area. Some people thinking, for instance, zero hours with the Tories because they talk about the economy and jobs. People did talk a lot about how boring their campaign was, but, 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 here's the thing. Some of their messages landed. Um, long-term economic plan, one woman said, if I hear the term long-term economic plan one more time, I'm going to jump out the window. But actually, the thing is, it landed. Um, the two things that landed were the economy and then the strength of Cameron's leadership. And then right in at the end popped the final thing, which was um, stability and certainty played against the chaos, potentially, of a Labour-SNP coalition. So. Uh, and then we asked afterwards people who'd voted Tory why they voted, and here are the reasons. So, Labour. Here's Labour's come dine with me menu. Now, what you need to know is that is not a sausage roll. Oh no, it's sausage en croute. Um, and this is not an ordinary pint of beer, this is beer that is brewed in a microbrewery in Primrose Hill. Um, what we're seeing here is a party with a very muddled brand, um, and I think that's what's what, that's what shone through. Let's look at the leader stuff. So here's Ed Miliband. Um, his animal is a panda. Um, so we get a bit of Wallace. We get honest, intellectual. That's not a compliment, by the way, just in case you were wondering. Uh, but he's a decent guy, um, but not a very strong candidate. And then what happened as the campaign went on? He's trying, he's trying hard, and he's principled, and that came through. That really shone through, actually. Um, and he stopped tiptoeing around and losing, using bland statements. I mean, he didn't have a bad campaign in lots of ways. But in the end, awkward and determined and untrustworthy. He's like a baby panda. He's cute and likeable, but clumsy and slow to get started. So, uh, actually, Labour got more mentions than anybody else, but the th the, any other party, but the thing is, they weren't very consistent. So, lots of messages landed, but it tended not to be the same message, and that was, that was the problem. There was a kind of lack of clarity about what Labour stood for, and that was the problem. Miliband was seen as passionate, but not in control. So, SNP. No surprises there. Well, maybe a little surprise. Um, you're wondering what this is on the right. It's a kale salad. Now, that is, actually, that was the English version, because it, what the thing about this is it's fresh and interesting, and that's how the SNP was seen. So you've obviously got your bit of haggis, but actually, you know, kale salad as well. So Nicola Sturgeon, it's quite interesting. There's how she started. Um, honest, intelligent, strong, but she became stronger, and she actually became quite likeable as well and fierce. And the animal's really interesting. 
because in England, she was a Siamese cat, whereas in Scotland, she was a lioness. Um, so, quite interesting. Siamese cats sidling up to you, getting what you want, goes next door after they've got what they want from you. Um, <laughs> but a mighty lioness in Scotland. Uh, she's fierce and she watches over the rest of the pack. So, they were the only party, I won't go through all the rest, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of more or less finish, finish the party stuff here, but they were the only party to end up in net positive, actually. But what we saw was, as you would expect, really, a polarisation between the messages that worked for them and what worked in Scotland and what worked in England. So um, voters in Scotland were having a kind of initial battle between their hearts and minds, but ultimately they voted with their hearts. Voters in England um, initially hadn't really heard of the SNP and were still a bit confused. I mean, we had some of the English voters wondering if they might be able to vote for Nicola Sturgeon because they quite liked her. Um, and they were a bit confused about that, but then respected and then ultimately a little bit feared as the campaign unfolded. Um, and, you know, that played out too in, 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 in their, the messages that landed. So the strength of Sturgeon as a leader, end of austerity in Scotland, but in England, fear that she would hold uh, Ed Miliband over a barrel. And that was about his weakness, actually, rather than her strength. Not necessarily a problem for a future leader, very much about him. So, what else did we learn? Just very briefly, a few other insights. So, we asked people the day after how they felt. That quote, a little bit disappointed, but a little bit relieved, was actually a Labour Party voter. Somebody who'd voted Labour and said, yep, I am disappointed, but actually, phew. <laughs> um, at least we'll continue in the same direction. People were very pleased to have a stable government, surprised and pleased. I didn't really want a Tory government, but I suppose the last five years haven't been that bad. And in a way, you know, it plays out as that old adage, there are really only two election, election themes, election slogans, there's time for a change or steady as we go. And ultimately, it was steady as we go. What else? If just a few other points that, that, that we learned. So I think one of the things that struck me through all of this was that all our voters going in were undecided. Um, but a lot of them were leaning one way or another. And I think what people do in this context, particularly in the excitement and frenzy of a campaign, is they garner evidence to support the view that they already hold, and they use that to filter everything that they see. So, uh, you know, we found, for instance, that the, the Conservatives are trusted to get the deficit down. So claims, however, that the benefits of recovery are working for everybody fell on deaf ears. They didn't believe that and nothing was going to persuade them by this time. They had a fixed view that they weren't benefiting from the economy themselves, and nothing was going to persuade them away from that. Equally, they believed that Labour uh, was going to mismanage the economy. Labour's deficit lot on the front page of their manifesto was, was way, way too late. It was just ignored by people who already had decided that they were spendthrift. So, the only policies that land, assuming any policies ever can, are those that symbolise a kind of deeper truth and something that people already believe. So, uh, you know, they resonate with long-held values. So Labour's non-DOMs almost worked, which is why the Tories actually had the dead cat strategy of distracting away from it, because it was actually starting to work. It was something that was quite popular, and it played to a strength and, and, and a, a, an existing belief. It worked. Um, policies that confirm an existing prejudice, so Labour's pledges are spend, 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 while the Tories, who actually had the biggest, um, you know, kind of uncosted pledge of all, which was their pledge to support the NHS to the tune of many billions, went unnoticed uh, or unchallenged for that reason. Counterintuitive policies can occasionally prompt reassessment, but I think they don't work very often. The example of it working here was Sturgeon in the debates talking about appealing beyond a parochial sort of <coughs> Scottish interest. But I think, actually, you can't rely on that happening. Okay, so what we found was that on many issues, the two main parties were quite simply mirror images of each other. And it's easy in this sort of post-election glow for the Tories to forget that, you know what, they weren't that good either. Um, they had lots of shortcomings. They were competent, but they were uncaring. 
whereas, the to whereas Labour were well-meaning but not competent. Um, the Tories were strong on the economy, but not in a way that was going to benefit ordinary people like me. Labour was strong on the cost of living, but were going to wreck the economy by spending and spending. And the Tories were actually dangerous on the NHS, whereas Labour were well-meaning on the NHS, but incompetent and incapable of delivering. But at the same time, what we also find is in lots of areas, those two main parties were flip sides of the same coin for a lot of voters. And a lovely little bit of animation there. Um, so they kind of look and sound the same. They're all posh career politicians, wherever they come from, whichever party they come from, apart from Nicola Sturgeon, of course, um, drawn from a kind of poncy southern elite. Um, and career politician is the worst insult that a voter can hurl at you if you're a politician. They talk to each other, they don't talk to me, or more precisely, they slag each other off. Um, lots of in-jokes I don't understand. They're competing on the same tiny patch of land. There wasn't much to inspire people, actually, and people weren't inspired, quite frankly, perhaps because of that. And this was a really interesting th thing. Almost everybody in our panel came to the conclusion that all the parties were talking to somebody that wasn't them. How big a failing is that? They all felt that all the communications was directed cleverly at some particular group of voters that wasn't them. So, in the end, the election was about fear. Um, and the question really was which, which fear was going to win out. Were people more fearful about their own finances or were they more fearful about uh, public services? And ultimately, I would conclude that trust in the Conservatives' competence and ability to deli deliver mattered much, much more. So, what, where does that get us? Um, one thing I'm doing now is, or I have just completed doing, in fact, is a piece of work for Labour. Um, and actually, I could have used any method I wanted to, but I chose to do focus groups and to do very in-depth, quite open focus groups to kind of understand um, what went wrong for Labour, um, to help Labour kind of, you know, work out what its longer-term goals need to be for the new leader and also to give the interim leader, Harriet Harman, some sort of quick wins, some short-term, how she could best use her time, the short time she has available. Um, and I debriefed this earlier. And I think, you know, looking at that and then reflecting on this, I think the writing was on the wall, really, in, in, in the, this Guardian work. I think it was pretty clear because ultimately, and this is private polling, I don't know if they're going to share it, but, um, you know, it was very much about the economy. Um, I can see John Curtis is in the room, so I'm not going to talk at all about uh, the polls and what went wrong. There are lots of things that are going to be considered. Um, we all have our views, but one plea I would make is that whatever methodological adjustments are made to uh, hopefully make sure uh, that those mistakes are not made in the future, I would say the new approach should pay much more attention to small data. Thank you very much. Thanks, Deborah, for making a very strong case against the big data election premise and arguing oh, for small data. Yeah. <laughs> Many of us at the RSS, I think, we, would probably agree that, uh, that there's a lot of virtue in small data. We've got some time now for questions and comments, so um, if anybody's interested, raise your hand. So, so yeah, Nigel Mario. Um, you, I'd be interested to hear about a bit more about the Taunton Dean one that you looked at, because one of the things the Lib Dems were relying on was an incumbency yes. effect. And I admit your slide showed that only 10% of the messages referred to local issues. So I'm wondering, did you pick up any evidence that there was going to be an incumbency effect? Because obviously it didn't transpire. Yeah, if you just pass the mic along. Hi, Deborah. Uh, really fascinating um, presentation. Um, I'm Bernie Aite from Shelter. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, um, given what you said about the importance of the economy, stupid, and you know, personality, was there anything you were picking up uh, amongst the panel uh, that steered you towards thinking that different groups were going to be more important this time round, yeah. given you know, previous uh, yeah. elections about Worcester woman and uh, yeah. Monday a man? straight to the next person. <laughs> Andrew Ketwick, voter. Uh, please could you say more on how you selected your panel? Yeah. 
Taunton Dean point then. Well, there wasn't an incumbent in Taunton Dean, actually. So uh, the MP had stood down, so it was a new candidate. So we weren't able to explore that. Um, but it clearly that, you know, since the, uh, the Lib Dems reduced down to, what is it, eight MPs, it obviously wasn't working so well for them. They have historically relied on that. I mean, I, you know, if I'd had to guess, I would have guessed, for instance, that Simon Hughes would have held onto his seat. He didn't. Um, I live in Hornsey and Wood Green, where uh, Lynn Featherstone, who is an incredibly popular local MP, lost her seat. Um, so I, I, I don't think that it, it helped them in the end. Or, you know, and certainly what we found was that when people were thinking about the election and the things that interested them about the election were what were going on nationally, not what was going on locally. They could have talked about anything they wanted, and they didn't. They didn't talk about local. Um, yeah, the economy. Um, Actually, I meant to pick up on a point that you made about the economy because it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? What, um, yeah, Labour has been unfairly blamed for causing the financial crisis. The problem, I think, is that perception is reality. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. You know, if that's what people think, then if the Labour Party want people to listen to them, they have to start their argument with where people are, not where they wish they were. Um, and, and actually, you know, the, the, the work that I've done since the election suggests that there is a complete conflation. I know people are wrong. Most people in this room probably know people are wrong, but it doesn't matter. If that's what they think, then that's what has to be dealt with. That's the, that's the challenge for, for, for Labour. In terms of different groups, um, I've always resisted all that kind of Worcester woman-y stuff. But what I would say is that I think one of the, um, one of the big things that has been overlooked, gender didn't seem to play a particularly strong part, but age... I think was massive and I think that Labour um, really, really underestimated the importance of older voters and massively overestimated the importance of younger voters. They, they targeted a lot of the campaign at young people, all the things like, you know, Millie Fandom and, you know, Russell Brand and all that stuff was all, and all their emphasis on social media and so on, a lot of, a lot of um, talking to young people and they didn't turn out and vote. And there aren't that many of them anyway. And Labour bled older voters, they just didn't really have an offer for older voters. So I think, that, I think there were some real issues there. Uh, Andrew, the panel selection. Um, so yeah, what we did was we recruited the panel um, in the same way that we recruit for focus groups or whatever. So we have recruiters around the country, we give them a spec, they go out in the street and they find people that match the spec. And the spec we agreed working through this with The Guardian, as I, I think I said. So we, in terms of demographics, we, we got a kind of a mix of people that was representative of the constituency that we were in, in terms of, you know, ethnic background, age, social class, and so on. And then in terms of voting intention, we matched it to what had happened in 2010. And then the other two screeners were that, that, that all the voters were undecided, and, but that they would definitely vote. Um, so that was that was what we did. Great. We have room for another couple of questions if there are any. So we've got three here, and these will be the last three questions. So. Hi, uh, my name is Matthew Shaddock. I work for Labrooks. Um, I know you said that local issues didn't prove to be very, didn't seem to be very important for the panelists. Mm. But I wonder whether the local tactical considerations in those seats, for instance, in Thanet South. Presumably, many voters had to think about yeah. um, the yeah. local electoral situation. Whether that uh, proved to be particularly important for for people in in, in your yeah. panels. Yeah. Sorry, I've got I've got enough questions now. Hello, uh, Anthony from the BBC. Um, despite the the strength of your the conclusions on the leaders, like you know, Cameron being a lion and Miliband being a panda, your conclusion in The Guardian was still that we were hurtling towards a coalition. So what, what extra were we learning? What was the extra insight? So... Um, I've got one more here. Oh, right, sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> Hello, Helena Djokovic from the Political Studies Association. Um, you said a lot of people actually wanted continuity and that was kind of the safer option for them. But were they then, to some extent, influenced by the polls in thinking that it would be another coalition um, yeah. you know or, or did they think well actually it was a purely conservative government and that was 
what they'd get the second time round. That question, I think, matches a bit with the tactical voting question. The tactical voting thing was something that people felt very kind of anxious about, actually, um, in in all of the constituencies that we were in, people were very worried about the, the broader implications of, of how they place their votes and what that might mean. Um, it was particularly true in Senate, um, but I think it was true to a certain extent everywhere. And in the end, I think people were trying to sort of weigh up, um, weigh up different outcomes. The other thing is that I think the way that people often interpreted tactical voting was quite simply how you would vote to prevent one outcome. So it would, for them, the definition of tactical voting was not, not voting to get the outcome you wanted, but voting to prevent the outcome that you didn't want, if you see what I mean. And that was how they interpreted it. And for a lot of people, that was what they were doing. So in Thanet, for example, I think there were enough people who were keen to vote to stop Nigel Farage, um, taking that as an, as an example. Um, what else? Anthony, the coalition. Yes, and I mean, actually, that, that ties together with your, your point too, because, you know, everybody was convinced that the polls were right. I was convinced the polls were right. You know, um, the people in the, in the focus groups were convinced the polls were right. They certainly thought that they were going to get a coalition. And when we contacted people the day after, obviously, they were as surprised as anyone else. Um, and that's where some of the relief came in, actually, because they were then actually often quite relieved that they were being handed a stable government rather than one that they thought might be unstable. Um, but for me, and I mean, that's, there was no extra insight. What, what I've just shared with you is what we were being told from our stuff. Um, I was then putting that together as were the people who were writing the, the thing up in The Guardian, with what we knew from the polls. And I was not trusting what I was hearing as much as I was trusting the polls, you know. My mistake. Great. Uh, well, we'll stop there. So if we can thank Deborah. Um, <laughs> OK, that's it.